Harbor High School and the Innovation Institute for 2016. Those people that are in the hallways need to come on in and finish their coffee out there and bring it on in and have a seat. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you here. Uh, Harbor High School is uh, just finished its 11th year as a high school for 105 years. Springdale Schools had one high school and uh, we were blessed to uh, borrow some of the great traditions of the Springdale School District. Uh, but innovation is something that has become a lifestyle in Springdale Schools. Technology is a tool. Today, you're going to learn how to innovate to help students learn. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you, but also to introduce to you uh, our Associate Superintendent of Schools in Springdale, Dr. Megan Slocum. You got applause. Yay. Thank you, good morning. So we have such a great group and this is a process that we work on all through the year. We're so glad to have you with us today and hopefully there are sessions out there. Hopefully you've pre-registered, you know exactly what your schedule is and where you'll be going today that's most comfortable for you and your technology ability. And the idea behind the Technology Institute is to try to drive you to greater things, to greater learning. How do you infuse technology in your classroom and how do you do that in a way that has a rich, rich emphasis for, for your students so that they have the understanding and the basis and the knowledge that they need. I can't go any further without introducing and asking her to come out, Miss Brooke Higgins, who is standing off to the side. If you would come out for us, Miss Higgins. You. She said, me? So she was taking a selfie. She was busy. Uh, this is Miss Brooke Higgins, who is our coordinator for all of the things that have to do with Innovation Institute, and she is also the lead for our grant through EMET. So if you would give her a hand for all of her work. Thank you. And then we have four technology TOSAs who have done an amazing job putting this together and helping to coordinate and organize. And I don't know where they are, but if they could stand, please. Oh, Paula in the back, if everybody could turn around and give them a hand. It's Mickey McFetridge, Shauna Polk, Ty Davis, and Laura Bishop. So thank you guys for your work also. And technology and communications, Mr. Trent Jones, I believe he's in the back. Oh, right here. Trent Jones, uh, down on his knee, uh, always working hard for Springdale School District. So uh, thank you guys for all of your help. We appreciate it. So we have sessions that are happening all morning. We have an amazing lineup and plenty for you to see and plenty for you to do. I would like to introduce first this morning, we have a speaker, a guest speaker that is with us and he is our keynote, Mr. Eric Podnos. And I hopefully I got the last name correct. Um, with my last name, I'm always used to people butchering it in some form or fashion. So he is a, a, a strategist for CDW and a blogger for EdTech K-12 Magazine. He's an advocate of the why before what in k-12 one, one initiatives works in districts across the United States and has really had an emphasis on building one-to-one -one capacity within school districts and that is the reason we have asked him to join us here in Springdale so please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker mr. Eric Podnos thank you. all right thank you dr. Slocum um, Brooke's going to get us switched over here, or not. Oops, sorry. Let me switch this. Okay. Um, perfect. Okay, let's get started. What are you doing, Joe? I am four, five, and eight. So do six, seven, and thirty. Yes or no? No. Oh, give me that. Oh, that's it. Forty cents. I'll pay thirty-seven on this bread. At forty. Twenty-five. What are you thirty? Three. Five. 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 Anyone know what that was? 
So, ooh, I forgot about the light. Um, so that was the live cattle futures pit at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And um, that was my job before I got an education. Um, you could see me there. This was about 10 years ago. Um, I started out as a clerk. So when like guys in yellow coats does all the hand signs and yells and screams at people. And then I became a live cattle futures trader. And um, I did that for about two years. And uh, there was a point where I realized I needed something more fulfilling from life. Um, something that was uh, something more, um, something that had to offer more, right? More than just going to work and making money. And that's when I made the decision to go back uh, to be an educator. Now, the reason why I bring this up, though, is because a huge trading floor full of people. Imagine this room, if we we're all packed in here sardines, shoulder to shoulder, you couldn't move. Um, people are screaming at the top of their lungs. From the time that I started at the Chicago Board of Trade uh, to, to, to um, about 2000, well, the, I forgot what year, 2006? Yeah, 2006. This floor today now looks like this. And the reason why is because all of the, the trading has gone from being done in the pit to now being done on computers. And this is just one example of how technology is changing people's lives. And it re this is, is one of the reasons that also set me off on this trajectory to where um, in the last 10 years, um, I've gone from um, clerk to trader to college student to special ed teacher, to instructional technologist, back into school to get my master's degree, to K-12 business development, now to education strategist at CDWG, and also an adjunct professor at a local university. So it, it was interesting when I first started in, in education, um, I was very anti-technology. Uh, I remember I was just telling Mike, uh, who's also here with me from CDW, about how uh, the very first paper that I had to write for college um, this was eight years ago now. Uh, I remember asking my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, um, how do I attach a document to an email? I have to turn this thing into my teacher. And I had no idea how to do it. And that's just how rapidly the world's changing. When you think about some of the statistics, oh, that's the slide I was looking for. Um, so yeah, so you can see that shift in technology and how it changed the trading floor set me off on this trajectory of um, clerk all the way to education strategist today. Um, I think my deck is sinking here. That's what I was looking for, okay. So um, interesting statistic that came out last year at ISTE um, from Intel that talks about how 65% of today's students are being prepared for jobs that don't even exist yet. And if you think about the story that I was just telling you about my transition from floor trader uh, to teacher to where I am today, um, that's one example, right? That's just one example of um, a job that didn't yet exist. K-12 strategist at CDW is a brand new job as of two years ago. That job didn't exist at one point. And so, um, we have to keep this in mind as we're preparing kids, you know, this idea that we're preparing them for their future, not our past, right? And so, um, quick background about me, um, like Dr. Slocum mentioned, um, I was a former educator, former instructional technologist, and uh, since joining CDW, I've had some really cool opportunities. Um, we get to work with Google, we get to work with Microsoft, we get to work with some of the best and most innovative companies in the world, and um, it's frightening and unbelievably exciting at the same time to know the technology that is here today, but also just right around the corner. So I want to back up about 100 years or so, and I want everybody to take a look at this slide. Um, and there's some really obvious things that stand out when you look at this classroom, right? Um, think of the arrangement of the seats in the classroom. Everyone's in rows. They're all facing the same direction. For the most part, every student 
in this classroom is looking at the back of someone else's head, uh, look at the arrangement of um, uh, the location of the teacher. Teacher is on the front of the class. It's very much your traditional didactic method of the teacher controlling the discourse in the classroom, which student gets to talk, how long they get to talk, those kinds of things. And then you fast forward 100 years or so, and we now, uh, schools are passing bonds. Um, you know, they're, they're getting funding maybe from some grants, some race to the top money. Um, maybe they're strategically reallocating some funding. They're no longer purchasing textbooks, and now they're purchasing devices. And technology has completely transformed our classroom from this <laughs> into this. And, and there's always this nice little chuckle after this, because it's funny because it's true, right? Um, but we have to ask ourselves, um, is simply adding this layer of technology to the old way of doing things, is this going to prepare students for their future? So I want to talk to you a little bit today about what that future is going to look like for these kids. So who remembers this? Sadly, there's probably somebody in here who's too young to know what this is. Um, does anyone have an idea, I want to take a guess, when did this come out? Just shout it out. 97. Nine, ooh, 97. Nah, a little early. 2001. Okay, 2001. First iPod. Remember this thing? It was black and white. It was heavy. had the scroll wheel, no touch screen wasn't connected to the internet. And if you've seen the first uh, Steve Jobs movie with Aston Kutcher that came out, um, it, it's funny, he, he comes walking out into an auditorium like this and it's all of his top engineers, his brilliant you know, computer scientists, and he's got this secret announcement to make, right? And he, and he walks up and he's building it up and he pulls it out of his pocket. And he's like, a thousand songs in your pocket, anywhere, anytime. And people just like lose it. They're like, yeah. This is going to be awesome, right? Um, yeah. Would anybody carry this, this thing around today in addition to all the other devices that you have? Probably not. All right. Next. Um, 2004, Mark Zuckerberg. Oop, didn't mean to do that. Mm, play. Nope. Okay, hold on. So this is a um, video of Mark Zuckerberg in 2004 uh, when Facebook uh, was just getting started. Let me play this really quick. CNBC used to have a show called Bullseye, hosted by our own Becky Quick. In 2004, long before Facebook was a household name, Mark Zuckerberg was one of Becky's guests. When we first launched, we were hoping for, you know, maybe 400, 500 people. Harvard didn't have a Facebook, so that's the gap that we were trying to fill. And now we're at 100,000 people, so who knows where we're going next. Um, we're hoping to have many more universities by the fall, hopefully over 100 or 200. And from there, we're going to launch a bunch of site applications, which should keep people coming back to the site and maybe could make something cool. What is the Facebook exactly? It's an online directory that connects people through universities and colleges through their social networks there. You sign on, you make a profile about yourself by answering some questions, entering some information such as... Okay, we all know what Facebook is. Did anybody catch the number of users? He said it kind of quick. 100,000 users in 2004. 100,000. A couple months ago, maybe six months ago now, Facebook celebrated their first day where they had 1 billion active users in a day. They have 1.5 billion active users on a monthly basis. Okay, so from 2004 to today, they've gone from 100,000 users to uh, 1.5 billion monthly active users. Um, this next one, next. Your concentration or mate. Nope, no more you, no more Mark. There we go. Um, Google Expeditions. Who's heard of Google Expeditions? Oh, cool. I get to share something very neat with you today. So Google Expeditions 
Um, well, here, let's just do this. My name is Lance Teasling. I'm in middle school in Eagle Grove, Iowa. Eagle Grove is not a very tall place. It's actually very flat. This is the tallest building on Main Street. It is about 50 feet tall. When I grew up, I want to be an architect and design skyscrapers. Yesterday at school, we went on a class trip. But this was not a normal trip with buses. This was something very different. The very first expedition we went on was to the Burj Khalifa. Go ahead and grab two hands and put them up to your face. It's so tall. Okay, we're gonna go to the 153rd floor. Google Expeditions is virtual reality in a cardboard box. So let's think about that for a minute, right? 2001, it was mind-blowing to people that you could walk around with a thousand songs in your pocket that you could listen to anywhere and anytime. And 15 years later, we're using virtual reality in a cardboard box in the classroom. That's some significant progress in 15 years. Does anybody know what the next 15 years are going to look like? Can anybody possibly predict 15 years from now what the kids in your classroom today will be doing or what the technology will look like? There's one thing I can promise you, the latest and greatest cell phone that you have in your pocket today is gonna be the worst piece of technology that your kids will ever know. <laughs> right? Think about, and I've got a cool phone. It does all kinds of things, right? I mean, we have GPS, heart rate monitor, high def video, uh, you name it, right? It's all here in our pocket today. So we've gone from a thousand songs in our pocket to literally just about everything you could possibly need in 15 years. So that being said, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with this thing. Um, I'm curious, does anybody know who this is? Any sci-fi fans? He has nothing to do with sci-fi, but kind of. So this is Ray Kurzweil, and um, he's, his title is the futurist at Google. I can't even, every time I say that, I'm like dumbfounded, like to think this guy is the futurist at one of the most innovative companies in the world. So Ray Kurzweil is working on the technology 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the road for Google. And cool story about um, Ray, I say Ray like he's my buddy. Um, so he wrote this book, um, The Age of Spiritual Machines, in 1990, and uh, in the 90s, and he made 147 predictions for 2009. So in the early 90s, he was saying that we'll have driverless cars, that the majority of um, content will be read on touch screens. He was making all these predictions, right? And out of 147 predictions, 127 of them were accurate or, wait, how do they phrase it? Correct or essentially correct. So he was like, he was right on or like pretty darn close, right? Now, that's significant because when you hear his predictions about the future, what, is, what does his past tell you about his future predictions? They're probably gonna be pretty accurate, right? So let's take a look at some of his future predictions. Um, by 2030, a $1,000 computer will be a thousand times more powerful than the human brain. So by 2030, maybe 2028, maybe 2031, 2032, somewhere in that area, right? 15 years from now, this, like we said, is gonna be a piece of garbage. People will just be throwing these things out like it's no big deal. I saw something the other day, Samsung has a phone that you can fold up and put in your pocket that may be out next year. Um, Google Glass. Anybody remember Google Glass? The dorky, I mean, cool glasses that you wear. Uh, and you can, you know, do the augmented virtual reality. 
So by 2030, there will be a chip implanted in our eye that will do essentially the exact same thing that Google Glass did. They talk about you could walk to another country and have a conversation with someone speaking a foreign language and it'll just translate everything in like subtitles, right? Imagine never being lost, never having to ask questions because of a chip implanted in your eye, okay? Kind of freaky, right? But kind of exciting. Next, this is the one that really messes me up. Has anyone seen Her with Joaquin Phoenix? If you are a sci-fi fan, this is an awesome movie. It sounds really weird. The guy falls in love with his operating system, which you think, like, this is insane. Why would I watch this? It's actually a really, really intriguing movie. Anyway, they talk about, uh, Ray Kurzweil talks about that by 2030, uh, artificial intelligence is going to claim to have a conscience. They're going to petition to be recognized of that fact, and most people will agree with it. That's 15 years from now. Remember, the iPod seemed like yesterday, right? Well, that next 15 years is going to come faster than anybody can possibly imagine. So we've gone, again, from 2001, a thousand songs in your pocket, to artificial intelligence claiming to have a conscience in 30 years. If you think back to that image of the desks being arranged in rows and the teacher at the front of the class and we all have smart boards and projectors now and the kids have Chromebooks or devices or whatever you want to call it, is that going to prepare them for this future? Are we preparing students for their future? It's a question that every educator and every parent really has to be thinking about. It all sounds like science fiction. I mean, look at the image here. At one point, this all sounded like science fiction, but think about what, they're, what, they're, what they have up here. Really, all this is is basically Google Hangouts, right? Or, or blended learning, like if anyone's taking an online course. I mean, that's basically what it is. You have your, your professor there on the left, and there's students receiving signals over the internet. And at one point, somebody said, this is going to be really cool. Let's do this one day. And they told him he was crazy. Right? So the stuff that used to seem like science fiction, like 30 years ago, if somebody would have told you you'd have GPS in your pocket when you just bought one for like $1,000, remember when these things were like super expensive? Or the camcorders? Remember like the concrete brick that you walked around with on your shoulder? It was like the coolest thing ever. So to put it, it into some perspective, these are kindergartners. Anyone quick at math, what year will these kids graduate? Twenty thirty-three. Anyone teach kindergarten? In here? No? Okay, anyone have a kindergartner? I do. I've got seven, five, three, and eight months at home, all boys. My wife is killing me right now for being here. No, she's not. Um, but think about that. Your kindergartner, by the time they graduate college, could, very, could be a very real reality, the chips in the eye or the computer or, or the different things we talked about. I'm doing on time. Okay. All right. A little flashback. Anyone remember this? Shall we play a game? Oh, that was kind of quiet. But you heard him, right? Remember that? Remember the name of this? War Games? Oh, that was the coolest movie ever when I was a kid. Um, so I want to play a game. A little game. Eh, it's not really a game. It's just actually kind of a website. But will your job be done by a machine? I found this on NPR on their website. I'm an NPR nerd. Um, they have a site where you can figure out what's the likelihood of your job being done by a machine someday. Now, all this talk of technology, there's probably some teachers in here right now thinking like, oh, man. Am I going to be replaced? Am I going to be needed someday? 
I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So anyone want to throw out, let's, um, you know, let's do this. Here we go. Okay, throw out a job, a profession, anything, anything besides education. Bank teller. All right, let's see. Well, we kind of know. They're already going away, right? <laughs> they charge you to go in and use the bank teller today, don't they? At Chase, they removed our tellers, and they just have, like, the drive through people. So bank teller, they're gone. Forget about it. You're done. All right, next. Chef. Chef. Oh, that's an interesting one. Uh, food preparation. Select job. Head chef. 10% chance of being automated. So let's think about that for a minute. Head chef. Uh, how many schools are cutting culinary arts programs? Do we even have home ec in schools anymore? You do? Oh, you guys are doing way better on budget than we are in Illinois. We don't have those kind of classes. We, well, some schools do, but... Well, let me ask you this. Are culinary arts on standardized tests? Not really. What does it take to be a good chef? Does it take creativity? Right? Does it take memorization? Mm, maybe. Maybe it takes some memorization. But are we forcing, are, as a chef, are you being forced to memorize things? Or are, you, are they just sticking because you love what you're doing? Right? There's a big difference between memorizing things and just knowing them because you love what you're doing. All right, let's try another, another one. Anyone have another pilot? Oh, that's going to be scary. Transportation. Uh, airline pilots, 18%. All right, that makes me feel a little better. I, feel, I travel a lot for work. Um, but trucks, big semi trucks. I want right here. Let me see if I can change it to that. Um, no. Oh wait, those are pilots. I don't want airline pilots. Transportation. Driver. Oh, there we go. Aha. Uh -huh. So I think it's Australia that are already starting to use autonomous semis. And so imagine truck drivers who drive, so I-80 is probably not, no. So I-80 is a freeway interstate that goes right straight across the United States. And there's truck drivers that will drive, for example, from Chicago to L.A. and L.A. back to Chicago. And it's pretty much a straight route there and back. Absolutely. Pretty soon there will be autonomous trucks making that route, right? All right, last one. The one that you probably all are dying to know. Will my job be replaced by a computer or a robot? Uh, I'll do high school teachers. Voila. You're safe, okay? Now, Technology can do some really amazing things for us, but it cannot replace teachers, okay? And when I say that, I want you to think about the number of times that you have or maybe someone you know who's put kids on a tablet or a device to play an educational game or to use an app, right? Maybe that's good for practice, but when you think about what's at the root of teaching and learning, it can't be done on a computer. Learning is a social process, and it's based on the relationships that teachers are able to build with their students, right? We're always going to have a job when it comes to education. Now, is our role as edu educators going to change? Absolutely. Do you have to be the Google in the classroom these days? Not when you have a kid with sitting, sitting with a device in front of them. Right? We don't have to know all the answers anymore. But what we do have to do is we have to be able to create those powerful conditions for learning. Right? And when I'm talking about powerful conditions for learning, I mean relevancy and authenticity in what our kids are doing. Um, there's a great story about 
Um, well, I won't go into that. We'll talk about it later because I'll be here all day. So, oh, wait, where does that thing go? Here we go. Um, all right, I got a couple minutes left here. Um, all right, so good news. Your jobs won't be replaced by robots. Um, but think about this, though. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. It will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And that doesn't just go for students. That goes for every single person in this room, every single person who works in education. For students, yes, absolutely. But if we continue to do things the same way we have for the last 100 years, but we add technology to that equation, and change nothing else, we're not gonna get the results that we're looking for, right? And that's why we're here today, is to think about our craft, think about our instructional practices, and think about what are you going to do to provide authenticity and relevance and all those really condi powerful conditions for learning and use technology as the amplifier for those good instructional practices. So to that point of learning, unlearning, and relearning, the CEO from AT&T, I think this was back in February, said that people at AT&T who are not spending five to 10 hours a week learning on their own will become obsolete. And he wasn't talking about on company time, right? Now, AT&T, maybe they said that for some different reasons that we don't really know, but at what point does that hit education, right? At, at some point, this will be relevant to us. So, when you see this, the first thing I thought of is, this is the old way of doing professional development, right? Sitting in, in meetings, bored out of your mind, things aren't necessarily relevant, you're not going to go and apply them right away, right? So, there's a new way to do professional development, there's a new way to stay relevant, there's a new way to stay current with the trends and keeping in mind that idea of preparing students for their future. How many people in here have Twitter accounts? Good, that's awesome, that's a good number of people. Um, and if you don't, that's okay. Twitter is not the end all be all. But what's most important is that you're making that effort to reach out and learn and connect with other educators. So this is, I, I guess what I had in mind when I, I put this slide together was professional development then which is this guy, and now, now. <laughs> this is professional development now. How many people do this when you're at home watching TV? You have a laptop, <laughs> right? You have a laptop on your lap, and you have your phone, and you're watching TV, right? This is how I get my professional development. I'm on Twitter, and I'm on a Twitter chat from 8 to 9 o'clock on Wednesday night. Right? And then boom, I'm done and I go to bed and, I'm, and I learned amazing things from educators just like me around the country or around the world trying to do the exact same things that I'm doing, right? So that idea that I just don't have time for Twitter, right? That's, that's not true. We make time for things that are important to us. And if you can learn in what, like I'll tell you right now, Twitter has hands down been the most transformative tool for me as an educator and the fact that you could do it one hour on a Wednesday night and it's gonna be more powerful than the majority of the old school professional development that we ever used to attend, you can't beat that, right? So it's not about working harder, it's about working smarter, okay? You don't have to go to ISTE to get good professional development. You don't have to go to these big conferences to learn from other ed educators. And like I said, Twitter is not the end-all be-all. Twitter's great, and it really works for me, but if Twitter doesn't work for you, there's a lot of other avenues for you to do this, right? For that five to 10 hours a week where people are expected to be learning on their own. If it's Pinterest, awesome. Use Pinterest, right? It's not about what you're doing, it's about the fact that you are doing it. Um, George Kuros, if, for those of you who are on Twitter, I'm willing to bet you're probably following him. If you're not, I encourage you to follow George. He's a, um, he's a great guy and, and also very uh, insightful, uh, influential thought leader. 
And I love this notion of isolation is now a choice that educators make. It's up to you. We're connected right here in your pocket, right? You can connect with educators around the world 24-7 on your phone. So if you're not learning and you're not growing, that's a choice that you're making today. There's no excuses anymore. So that being said about Twitter, um, we're going to do uh, a little promotion, I guess. And I'll make this quick because I know I'm running out of time. So we have something called a tweet wall. And for the rest of the conference, those of you who are um, tweeting, let me pull up the actual live feed here. No, where'd it go? There it is. Okay, so this is our tweet wall for the Innovation Institute. Every time you tweet something, it's going to show the 15 most recent tweets that get sent uh, using the I2Sdale hashtag. Okay? Um, the way that it's determining who's on the leaderboard is by um, engagement on Twitter. So you could send a million tweets it's not going to matter if there are a million boring tweets and nobody's interacting with you or, or retweeting you or engaging with you. So it's measuring based on engagement. So if you send something really thought-provoking or you send out a really good resource that you learned from one of today's sessions and people are retweeting it or replying to you or asking you questions, that's what's going to move you up the leaderboard. Does that make sense? So you could tweet I2S Dale a thousand times, but if no one retweets it and nobody cares, you're not going to move up the leaderboard. Now, you're probably asking yourselves, why do I want to be on the leaderboard? Why do I care about this? Um, so the reason why is because our company works with a very cool company called Little Bits. And Little Bits was kind enough. I told them I was coming down here to do the keynote. And uh, we got talking about it, and I said, well, what if we do some kind of like little contest, and I'll use this Twitter wall. And so the gizmos and gadgets kit from Little Bits, how many people know what Little Bits is? Oh, just a couple. Okay, cool. Well, you're going to get a chance to learn more about Little Bits at the conference. I brought two kits. Um, little Bits, in a way, is kind of like the modern-day snap circuits, if you remember what snap circuits are from when we were kids, but like 100 times cooler. And so... I brought a STEAM student kit that the uh, students here at the school are going to be playing with in, in making things and creating things. Um, but then we also have a Gizmos and Gadgets kit, which is about a $200 kit that have like 15 or 20 different combinations that you can make these inventions that do some really cool things. My seven-year-old geeks out on this stuff all the time. So the Gizmos and Gadgets kit, at the end of the two days, will go to the person who's on the top of the leaderboard, okay? So when you're in sessions and somebody says something interesting or thought-provoking, share it because somebody else can't be in your session, right? That's the beauty of Twitter. There's teachers in this district who couldn't be here today, but if you're tweeting the stuff that you're learning and you're sharing your resources, they can learn from you when they're not here at this conference. So those of you who are here and you understand the value of Twitter, Let's blow this thing up and so we can share the, with the teachers in this district just how valuable this can be, okay? And for those of you, who sh whoever shows up at the top of that leaderboard is going to get that $200 Gizmos and Gadgets kit at the end of the conference. Does that sound good? Anyone interested? Crickets? No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so that about wraps things up. Um, The final thought that I want to leave you with today is that of all the stuff that we talked about, some really exciting things that teachers are doing in, in education with technology, but it's based on your skills as a teacher. Technologies amplify whatever pedagogical capacity already exists. So those of you who are good teachers and maybe still intimidated by technology, don't be. Because the people who are most effective at integrating technology in their classroom are those who are really good teachers, are the ones who know how to manage a classroom, who know how to build relationships with students. If you're a good teacher before technology, you're going to be an even better teacher with technology. 
So whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. Thank you, and have an awesome day today, guys. Thank you very much, Eric. If Again, if we could thank Eric for coming and giving, sharing his ideas. He'll be back tomorrow with a completely different keynote. We have just a few announcements and some details that you might want to know about to help you get around the Institute today. We'll move through these pretty quickly. And uh, you should all have access to your schedules. They were sent to you through email. They should have come yesterday to your email inbox. There are schedules posted around the building. We will be making announcements about two minutes before each session closes so that then the presenter knows that they're ready to move on to the next session. You are here, and sessions are where those two large red boxes are. You're gonna follow the hallway out the door to those sessions, and you'll see a lot of signs that'll help you get to your sessions. We do have some food available for you. We've got food trucks for lunch. We've got fellow coffee and the baristas here selling coffee for those of you who are interested. The food trucks will be out in the courtyard outside the cafe and you're welcome to eat outside or in the cafe. And that's where that is located. The event hub is in the rotunda that happens to be in the middle of all of those classrooms where the sessions will be. Here are some things you'll find in the rotunda today. Please make sure and stop by and see the students who are showcasing projects that they've been working on throughout the year. We've got robotics and 3D printing, some Lego building. So check out what they're doing. We've also got a lot of students in sessions presenting. The rotunda is there where the yellow circle is. Our tech support is there, we've got a charging station, and prize patrol is there as well. If you haven't gotten online, this sign will be in every single room at the front of the room, so you don't need to snap a picture now because you'll see it in every room you're in. If you would like to see or have access to the digital resources that are available today, you can get that on our website. That web address is in every room as well. You're just gonna click on the schedule and map button and then select today is day one. You'll see the names of the sessions alongside the times and the rooms. The name of the session, if the presenter has provided a resource, is the link. If you want to select some new sessions or didn't get to select sessions, the session title and descriptions is there for you. It is in alphabetical order. If you need any help, look for the t-shirts, the black t-shirts. We did have a Springdale High School student design these, and anyone who has a black t-shirt on should be able to help you with navigation, scheduling, and more. So thank you to everyone who made this event possible. I don't know why we have some random animations here, but we're just gonna go ahead and click through them. I do wanna thank the Innovation Institute planning team and the Springdale Technology Integration Specialist, they played a huge role in planning this event. This event could not happen with all of, without all of these people. After the event, you will get a follow-up email. It will include your certificate of attendance. Please provide us some feedback in the survey link that you will get. We do have some amazing prizes. You are entered to win by just showing up today, but you can also better your chances by tweeting and sharing your learning. So just like Eric was just talking about, share what you're learning in your session so that people who are not here can benefit from that. We do even have someone who is out in the hay fields in southwestern Missouri who's checking her Twitter feed today and is very excited about what she's gonna learn. So you are connecting with people definitely outside of this building. So before we end, we do have three giveaways. I think it's always fun to start with some prizes. We'll have prizes throughout the day, but we've already randomly selected three people who checked in this morning. 
for some prizes. And Laura's got our first prize is a set of Yeti tumblers. And this goes to Katie Surly. And I saw Katie in the hall out front. So come on up and grab those from Laura. Our next gift or our next prize for the day is a $100 Amazon gift card. And that is going to LaDonna Mendleski. LaDonna, are you here? There you go. Great to have you here today. What a great way to start out your morning, isn't it? And our final prize for the morning is a GoPro camera, a Hero GoPro camera. And Laura's going to run and get that. This prize goes to Sierra Clegg. Where are you, Sierra? She may be down in her room. I cannot see, but she is here getting ready for a session. Oh, there she is right up there. All right, well, congratulations to all the winners already, and I hope to see you all in the hallways. Please share what you're learning. Don't forget, tweet it out, Instagram it, and head on down the hall. Thanks.